any time if you have questions, I want to encourage you to use the Q&A panel you see in the screenshot. You should find it on the right side of your screen. I'm going to turn it over to Kim Baxter here in a minute to do a large part of the presentation. She is the birthday girl. Don't ask her how old she is in the Q&A section. All right, Kim, go for it. Hi, everybody. Happy Friday. We're going to talk about the Allscripts Practice Management System today. We're going to, uh, let me introduce myself. Um, I'm a practice, a professional services consultant with Galen for about four years. And before that, I worked in many various aspects of the healthcare industry, including frontline receptionists all the way to uh, administration and management, and then into the IT world. So I have a vast background and know what your frustrations are every day. So I can sympathize with you and also maybe give you a few pointers that will help you out. What we're going to learn today is we're going through the patient registration screens in the application. We're going to explain the fields under registration, and then we're going to look at the remaining tabs and, and look at some of the purposes behind those tabs. We're also going to schedule a patient and explain the fields that you see when you're in the, the different patient scheduling screens and what your right-click options are and how those can be very helpful to you. Then we'll go over the remaining tabs under the scheduling portion and some of the reports and things that go along with the scheduling. Most of today's webcast, however, is going to be actually in the application and not off of the slides. Before we get into the application, though, there are a few things I want to talk about so that you can follow along with me. One of them is uh, some of the navigation and common terminology. Again, this is like a, window, a Windows-based application, so you have your typical menu bar up here with your tools and so forth. Then you have your toolbar options, so your little icons on your toolbar. Your standard minimize, maximize, and closing the window, what this does is close the application. First lessons of the day. It's better not to close the application with method. Um, I have seen it happen where the application will hang with this user's login. And then if you have it set up where the user can only log into the application one instance at a time, they go to another workstation and try to use it, it will not let them log in because they're hung up on here. And then you'll have to get your IT department to go in and, and disconnect them. It'll take some time. The recommendation is to use your file, log off, or your little icons here that mean log on and log off. Then we're going to talk some terminology. Over here you have little file folders. And then you have subfolders underneath. Your main file folder is called your function group. Underneath there, the, the subfolders are called function folders. So if you hear me speak about function group and function folders, this is what I'm referencing. These function group and function folders reside in your navigation pane. And then, of course, the middle, the big screen here is your child window or your working window. We're also going to see a lot of the same icons within the application working throughout. <clears throat> so let's go over some of those. The first thing we're going to see is you see this little key. In the application, if you know an exact search field, like the patient's medical record number is the most common thing that is set for this. So if you know the patient's medical record number exactly, you can key this into the search field and hit enter or tab, and it'll immediately go straight into that patient's record. If you use the, the most common function, which is the binoculars, when you search for a patient, you can search in multiple different contexts, and we're going to kind of look at that when we get into the application. But it brings up a sub-window to allow you more flexibility. So it gives you a little um, versatility in looking for the patient in multiple different ways. When you see the wand, 
you can see the wand, magic wand means you're going to create something new or you're going to add something. Then, of course, the X is deleting an item. And in the scheduling, you're going to see this little um, notepad. This means that we're looking at a memo appointment or we're going to schedule a memo appointment. And then if you have it set up in your system, some people do, um, it's a setting with under practice options, and we're not really going to go into a lot of that today, but there is an opportunity for you to have to set a potential patient, and this is if you allow your system and your schedulers to schedule a new patient um, without getting the full registration and starting an encounter and linking that to an encounter until they actually arrive and you create a patient for them at that time. And then this is a dialog box. It's seen in various different places in the application and it just means that when you, when you select this, it gives you a window to create a documentation or it provides you with options that you are allowed to do within that part of the application. So let's, I'm going to take this tip and trick and I'm actually going to show it to you rather than read this to you. So let's go into the application. Give me just a second here to change screens. Okay, can you see my screen okay? All right, so here yep, we, we have like a, thank you. We have the, the toolbars that I've talked about and the icons. We have your patient management and your scheduling. That's where we're going to focus our time today. One of the key things that I hear people say that's frustrating to them is I'm in the middle of registering a patient and hey, Kim. yes. Kim, can you, can you maximize that screen? Let's see here. Is that better? That is better. Thank you. Okay, so they will say that they're in the middle of registering a patient and they get a phone call and they have to schedule an appointment and they can't go out of the registration to schedule without losing it. So they either have to lose the what they've worked on or they have to put the patient on hold for a while so they get this registration complete. However, there is an option for that. So we're in the patient registration now. We get our phone call that we need to schedule an appointment. Kim, sorry, this is just very. No, it's it's changing screens on me here. There we go. All right, so we want to open a secondary window to be able to schedule an appointment. Well, it keeps changing back and forth. I apologize for that. Okay, we're in registration. Patient calls. We right click on appointment scheduling, and you can see you can change your active window. You can open an appointment scheduling using the current patient. You can change the, um, to a window with appointment scheduling without a patient present, or you can open an appointment window. So what we're going to do is we're going to open an appointment scheduling in a new window. Now it looks like our registration went away. However, up here on our little toolbar where our icons are, if you click this cascade, we've opened several windows, thanks to the hesitation there. Let's get rid of some of those. Okay, so as you can see, in the background we've got registration, in the foreground we have appointment scheduling. You can toggle back and forth between these windows so that you don't lose that registration. So that's a little tip there in case you didn't know that you could do that. Also, if you notice when we change screens, your icons will change. Depending on where you are within the application, your ability to do certain things changes. So if we're in the appointment book, we will have different icons than when we're in registration. You can see all the icons that come available. So let's dig into the nitty-gritty here and let's really get to understanding what all this is. 
So I have a test patient pulled up. Now the way I found this test patient, if I knew the patient number, I could put that in and hit tab, and it'll pull in my patient automatically. But if I didn't know what the patient's medical record number is, I can put in partial information or anything, and I can hit the search, and as you see, it pulls up a search window. And it looks at a ton of information, and you can search by multiple fields. So if you've got a patient, David Smith, and you know the social or the date of birth, you can put the name here and the social, and it will pull that up. Let's look at some of these options. So you've got your typical social security number, date of birth, enterprise account number, patient account number, guarantor name, phone numbers, medical record number, certificate number, patient alias, so if you, uh, and I'll show you where you can put an alias in there, and advanced search criteria. Now, I skipped this one, and the reason I did is because it's very interesting, and I love this. I've had to use this before. So let's say patient David Smith comes in, and you search, and you search, and you search, and you cannot find Mr. Smith by the name. There's just nothing there. So you can go to the sound X and type Smith and do your search, and it actually pulls up a patient with a S-M-Y-T-H, and that is taking in context what could be the name and looking at all the similarities and giving you feedback on that so that you can, you can broaden your search. This is great for people with, like, the last name Green. Um, I've had a patient with the last name of, of Dodson, and sometimes they have a D-O-D-S-E-N or a D-O-D-S-O-N, things like that. You, you can look by Soundex. So for today, we are going to do this. All right, so we have up here the Summary tab. In the Summary tab, it's doing just what it says. It's giving you a summary of this patient. So I'm verifying this patient's information. I'm looking at their address, their phone numbers, their employer, all the pertinent information here, their contact information for their account, uh, policies, information on their policies. And as you see, if I highlight a policy, the information over here to the right changes because it's pertinent to that particular policy. And then if you hover over these, you see the hand turns blue. That means that's going to give you a hyperlink to these other tabs. So let's just hyperlink over to the patient information. So patient tab, this tab is giving you your demographic information, pretty much just the basics, the name, um, social security number, uh, date of birth, employer, zip code, and a feature that a lot of people do not know or that is available with Allscripts PM is the zip code lookup. So if you're putting in a new address for the patient and you don't know what the zip code, the city and state is, but you've got their zip code, and this also helps speed up registration. Um, you can actually look by, so by zip code. So, Six zero zero three eight four, and if it was in there, it would come back. Okay. If you need to look by city, and I've actually had patients not know what their zip code is. Then you can look by city, and it'll give you a list of zip codes by city. Okay. Now, as you notice on this screen here for the zip code lookup feature, there's a button that says new zip code. When you get your system, you will get 
a download of all the zip codes within so many mile radius of your facility. Um, it will give you that, and same thing with the employers. You get a, you get a minimal of information, but you might have an instance to where you've get, seen someone from out of town or even out of the country, and you need to put an address in here. You have the option of on the fly adding a zip code. Now, I have seen it where some entities restrict who can add new things to the system, like new health plans and new zip codes and new employers that has to go through a process, a change control process. So if it depends on your facility. If you have the security set up to allow that, you can add that on the fly. Same thing here with the employer. Like I said, if you have the security to add an employer on the fly to your system, you've got the little wand and it will actually let you add that employer's information. Um, but sometimes that is restricted through security setup. Now we're down here with the providers. You're going to see a little similarity when you change screens from this screen to scheduling, where you've got the usual provider, the referring, and the PCP. The reason that you have three different options Let's say you are the primary care doctor's office in the sense that maybe the patient doesn't have an HMO, but this is a multi-provider clinic, and the clinic has mid-level providers or nurse practitioners and PAs, and the patient comes in and they always see that mid-level provider. Very seldom do they actually see the, the DO or the MD. So for PCP purposes, it's going to be the, the, the doctor, the MD, the DO that's in the office, or even could be the supervising provider of that mid-level if you want to do it that way. But the usual provider that the patient sees is going to be the mid-level. Then you have the referring provider. So for registration purposes, let's say I'm not the primary care office, but I am the specialist office. The referring provider is who's referred this patient to your office to be seen. So if, it's the, if nobody referred them as far as another provider, or maybe they just looked you up on their insurance list, then you can put the PCP's name in there so that you have that field covered that normally it's going to be who referred that patient to you to establish care in your office. Now, when we get into scheduling, we're going to look at it as a little different concept, so keep that in mind. Marital status, employment, student, this is on here, and I recommend that if you do um, a lot of student if you're in a college area or I've seen this application even used in a university type setting where they see students in a, in a healthcare on, on site at a university, it gives the student status. This helps you uh, from a billing perspective if you're, you are seeing a patient that's getting close to the cutoff age. If you get a denial, you can kind of look at that and see why. Inactivation date, this is the inactivation date of this account. Not the information, but the actual account. So if you put a date in here, it's going to make this patient inactive and you will not be able to do anything with it. So don't put a date in there unless for, for true purposes you are no longer going to see this patient. Okay, then you have your HIPAA statement expiration date. This is the expiration date, not the date you gave them the HIPAA information. That what this will do is trigger a recall to help remind you later that you need to update this. So if I gave this patient their HIPAA information today, then I'm going to go up here and change it a year from now because we do it annually, and then that way it'll trigger a recall to remind me that I need to get a new, new HIPAA information. And this is the relationship to guarantor. Now, we haven't named a guarantor on here yet. We will do that in the next tab. 
but this is going to be what is the patient's relationship to the guarantor that we are going to identify. And in this case, I've marked it as self. We're going to look at that here on this next tab. Now, comment sections, you're going to see several different areas that comments are allowed. And people have a tendency to be afraid to put comments in there because they don't know where they're going to show up. So one of the things we're going to talk about today is where in the application each of these comments areas show up. In this particular instance, this is general comments about your patient, such as the patient is deaf, patient will need wheelchair assistance, things like that. This will display on the patient scheduling tab, and it will print out on the patient's schedule when you print this. We can print them out daily. This is not printable in patient statements or bills. So next we're going to go to the account tab. So this is where you build the patient's account. So first tab is demographics. This you're building the patient's account information. First thing is you notice it asks for an account type. Your account type it can be many things. It defaults to standard, but you can also have in here, if you do uh, several ancillary services, uh, ophthalmology or different things like that, and the patient only comes to you for ophthalmology services, you can create an account type for ophthalmology and it will drop into that only. You can, well, they'll know it's only for ophthalmology. You can also, if you do workers' comp or occupational medicine, along with standard care, you can create an account type for occupational medicine. That lets them know the only time this patient is allowed to see us is for this type of service. However, if they're going to be, have access to all the services that you have, then you want to make it a standard account. You can also flag an account as a bad address, a bankruptcy budget account. This is if you have a patient on a payment plan, maybe they own a past balance and, and they're, you're working with them through your collection module here in the application, you can set it up as a budget account. Also, you can set it as a collection account. And again, working with the collections module, you can do many things by setting the account to here. You can flag a patient as deceased and an employee or pre-collections. So if you have an in-house collections, you can, you can flag it as pre-collections or delinquent account. And then you can set up other account types if you choose, but keeping in mind that when you set up different account types, if you work with the other modules, such as collections or the office manager uh, module of the application, the more account types you set, the more build, uh, build you have to do in configuration to get those other functions to work properly. We have another comment section here. This particular comment section is related strictly to that account. So the, that comment section is visible in the charge and paste payment posting area. So when your charge and payment posters go in to, to work on this account from their, from their screens, they will see this comment. So if you have something related that they need to know about, this is where you can put that comment in. So here we have a little window and you see it says contact with different levels of contacts here. Your first contact is always going to be your patient. And because we mark the patient their guarantor, the guarantor check mark is already marked here. Now, let's just say Okay. I'll have to fix that. We'll show you how to do that. Let's just say that there um, is another guarantor. Let's say the patient's not the guarantor. We change this to child. This will be blank here where the guarantor button is highlighted. And when we add a new, a new contact, you can see it comes available and we can make someone else the guarantor. 
But if you do that, you need to go back to the screen, the patient screen, and change the relationship. So keep that in mind. Oops, I added this new, new uh, contact here, and I don't need it. You highlight that and click X, and it'll ask you for sure to make sure you don't want to delete it. If you do, you can say yes, and it'll go away. Tip on uh, removing contacts. When you remove a contact, it goes away and it doesn't come back. There's no historical review of that information. So be sure to um, not remove a contact unless you know for a fact you, you should not in a way, a shape, or form uh, contact that person. However, I have seen it where they expire the contact or they put a note, a comment down here, and the, you can put a comment on every single contact. This comment field is related to this contact only. So comments here relate specifically to whatever contact you have highlighted here. And that's the only place you will see that comment screen. It will not show up anywhere else. When you're building your contacts, you have to think, especially if this is a child, who is responsible to pay the bills? And if this is in a split household, where do the statements need to go? The patient might live with the mother, and the father is responsible for paying the bills, so you want the statements to go to a different address. So you create the father's contact here, and you can mark that contact strictly for just the statement. And it'll let them know that the statements will only go to this address. You can also change your subscribers. As you can see while I go, it wouldn't let me remove this subscriber because it says it is tied to an existing policy. So if you ever want to change a subscriber, you have to first go in and you have to expire out the policy and add a new one and then you can go back and assign who the proper subscriber is on the new policy. Okay, and again, your contact information is specific to whatever is in this screen. So if I've got this uh, person, it's not, let's say it's not me, uh, it's just the guarantor, the address, phone numbers, work, date of birth, everything is related to that contact, okay, not the patient. And then you always have the relation to patient here. So the, the front screen, you have the relation to guarantor. How is the patient related to the guarantor of this account? Over here, you want to know how the contact is related to the patient. So we're going to say this is the mother, father, I guess since David will make it the father. So this is the father of the patient. So it kind of does a role reversal in your mind. You have to think about that. Next we have the policies tab. Now, if I did not have if I did not have anybody marked as a subscriber on this account, this policy tab would not be visible to me. You have to have someone identified as a subscriber before this policy tab will come effective. And I will show you that on a test patient in just a moment, just to kind of show you what I'm talking about. This is strictly just your policies. What policies are available for this patient? You have multiple different things you can put here. Again, you can add a new policy or you can delete a policy. Different organizations have different philosophies beside it, though I, ah, about deleting, I'm getting tongue tied, about deleting policies. Um, I personally like to expire a policy out and not delete it, especially for a year, maybe. That gives you, the, the, the information is still in your system if you ever need to work a billing issue. So your billing office will have that historical information in here 
if you just expired out. And when I say expired out, what I'm talking about is you've got the patient's information, uh, primary coverage. You can choose primary, secondary, tertiary, other primary, other, and not available. So this Aetna, what I did here is marked it other. I could have marked it not available if I wanted to, but I changed it to other, and then I put an expiration date on here. This is letting our billing system know this patient was on Aetna between these three years, but it's not effective now. However, if they have a claim from November of 2013, they need to reprocess, they still have, if I had it in here, the certificate number and the group number and everything like that to reprocess that claim without going back and bothering the patient, having the patient try to hunt down that information. I know in the past, patients get that new information, they immediately throw the old one away because they don't want to get it confused. So many times the patients don't even have it anymore. So I like to keep the old policy in for about a year and then you can delete it out to clean it up so it doesn't get all junky. But it's just good to keep for a short time frame. Now let's look at the options we have here. We have primary, secondary, tertiary, other primary and other. And yeah, that kind of sounds goofy. But this comes in handy. Like I said, if you are a multifaceted facility and you do lots of ancillary services and the patient comes to you for medical care, ophthalmology care, they see your occupational medicine facility for uh, workers' comp or auto accidents or you have urgent care and they have um, AFLAC for other urgent care, you can keep that as other primary. Um, that's what the other primary is for. So I, I worked at a facility recently that they did have a very robust uh, urgent care and occupational medicine facility. And if a patient came in and saw them for that type of service, they put the, that employer under other primary. And that way they could tell the difference between their regular health insurance and their workers' comp or their automobile insurance by doing that. And again, you've got the comment screen here. It's related to that particular coverage, and it will show for you in the charge and payment posting screens to aid you in posting properly if you, need, if you have a question on which policy and to make sure you're getting posted correctly. So that's what I, they've used. They, uh, the, one of the instances they had is a patient saw their family practice physician there, but he also came in for an auto accident. So they had an other primary for that visit, and then a couple months later he got hurt on the job and came back and had another injury under another insurance. So it really helped them. Um, and you can put the effective date in here as the date of injury so that you know, and there's another place we can put information like that too. You can keep track of which injury goes with which insurance. And then we go to the additional information tab. And as you saw, that was a little warning saying I didn't put my group number and everything in there. So it'll kind of prompt you if you're missing information that's, that's needed to process claim. So this is uh, sometimes referred to as your meaningful use tab because it has in here a lot of the items that you're going to need for your meaningful use or other uh, accreditations and things that you try for. You, so you have your race, your ethnicity, your language, and these come um, delivered the most common options for this. You can add these through your file maintenance, but I've seen that it comes pretty robust with the things that you typically would need. You've got your HIPAA notice. Now this is actually when the patient was given their notice. This is not um, 
the expiration date. So on the front screen, you've got expiration, and on the screen, you got when you actually gave it to them. Then you have the date of death, and you can mark the account as deceased, but you, what you need to do first is you need to come back here and mark the date of death. When you mark this date of death, if you have your interface set up correctly to your EMR, you put the date of death here, it triggers a flag to go to your EMR, and it marks the patient deceased in the EMR. So changing the account type to deceased does not trigger that. It's putting a date in this field is what is what triggers that flag. And then here's where you can put the alias. This comes in handy for um, marriages and things like that, or if you've got Elizabeth and she always calls by and goes by Betty, to put this in here so that if you're having trouble searching for the patient, you have this option to also look under their alias name. And secured patient, if you watched our webcast um, a couple months ago, we had one on confidential patients and setting up special securities. And one of the things that was talked about was having a secured flag on a patient. Now, when you mark a patient in this area as a secured patient, the message that gets sent over to the EMR will trigger that the patient is a, is a secured patient and only people with proper security will be able to access this patient record. The other caveat to this is that this patient's name will not be on the schedule. So the, the schedule slot will show that it's filled and it might have, you know, the pertinent information there of certain things, but the patient's name will not show. And only people that have the proper security in the EMR will be able to see that. Then if you have a patient portal, you can put your patient portal information here. There are tons of information that I've seen on this additional information field screens. And those are all set up under your system admin, under your practice options, and you fill out your additional information fields here to make these active. I've seen patient um, referred to us by or um, some of the marketing materials, if you've given the patients things regarding your new service that's coming down, you can kind of look at that here. There's lots of things that I've seen people use very creatively in this field, in these fields. All right, so we were talking about policies and all the different things. Real quick, what I want to show you is we have primary here. And you see this little ailment button. So let's click on the other real quick. If I was seeing patients for an auto accident and they came in and told me that this was an auto accident and they was only going to be seen one or two times, then I would want to click on this ailment information, this little red X. And I can mark on here what type of ailment. I can create a new type of ailment. And over here, you can see you can change it. You can do all fields. Um, and it'll change depending on the type of ailment as to what you have set up in your back end for if configured for this. So a brief ailment, you know, auto accident, fell in the parking lot, twisted their ankle, something like that. You can put that in here, What the, a comment about this ailment. You can do case types. Uh, is it related to their employment? Is it related to an accident? The first symptoms, the first date consulted. You can track a lot of information that will help your billing office get claims paid by putting this information in here. So please work with your billing office to get this. If you've not used this functionality, it's really great. And I encourage you to work with your billing office and get this set up. And Galen would be more than happy to work with you if you've never used this functionality, that we can help you learn the functionality and how to use it and how it relates to your collections and your office manager and things like that. So just let us know and we'll be glad to help you with that. 
Okay, so here you've got a check mark. So you've put a new element in and you want it attached to this policy. That means that any time you update information, it'll attach to that policy. All right, we are going to close this window. Now, we're going to go to notes. No, we're not talking about notes as far as patient notes for their visits. That's in the EMR, not in the PM. So think differently when you think of notes. So notes in this instance are notes about the patient's account. It can be billing related. It can be, um, well, there's just, there's a lot of different types of notes. You've got patient notes, claim notes, um, voucher notes, and you only have one tab here, and it's the note management tab. Again, we have the patient pulled up here. We've got their basic address information. And you can check mark multiple, but as a standard, it comes just looking at the following top three. So your patient notes are just general notes on the patient. Um, patient went to the Bahamas, asked them about their trip. Something silly, if you want to use it that way. Collection notes. This is pertaining to collections on the account. It can be in-house collections or out-of-the-office collections. So um, maybe your collection agency that you use called and said, we've lost contact with this patient. If they call you, get information. You can put that in here. Other account notes, this could be related to different accident, different accident accounts and different things. You can be very creative. You can also make policy in your office. You don't use other account notes. We're not going to look at those. So that's definitely specific to your office. Claim notes, self-explanatory, HIPAA notes. This is uh, notes related to their HIPAA. Do not release information to patient's ex-wife. Um, different things like that. So you can, that's what your HIPAA notes is going to be about. Service notes. This is related to the time of service, things that are related to the dates that they're being seen. You can kind of see where claims and services go back and forth. However, service notes aren't related to anything that's gone out to the health plan yet. You can think of it that way. And voucher notes, when a patient comes in, the appointment is made. Once a charge is assigned to that account, it's created on a voucher. So these are, the voucher notes are anything that's related to charges for that patient. So anything, anytime you need to look up a specific data service, you're going to need a voucher number to look at that information. And we plan on doing more webcasts for the practice management, and one of the things we're going to get into is financial processing and talking more about claims and collections and vouchers. So I don't want to go into detail about that right now today. But let's just, um, we're going to create a new one. So we've got our little wand over here, and it gives us the date, and then we skip down here to the note type. Right, so the note types are created in your file maintenance system or file maintenance area. You can create several different note types. And alerts are things that pop up. Bad address, you can see all the different types of note types that we have in our system. But we're going to create an alert, okay? The subject of this alert is Check insurance before scheduling. Okay. So patient insurance shows expired. Check coverage before scheduling and appointment. This does not stamp this. Um, other than what you do up here with a date and time. So I recommend um, that you put the initials of the person putting this in, and if 
if time if things are time sensitive, put the time that they put it in here. But at least put the initials if you can. And then you save this note. Okay. Now we're going to create another one just for fun. This is just a test. All right. So we have these in here. This one we set as an alert, and this one we just set as a simple patient note. When we go to scheduling, we're going to look at how that shows when we do the scheduling. If I wanted to delete this note, and I could delete it, then it would go away. There are some notes that you can set, depending on how you set up your note types. You can set up uh, to have an expiration date. That way uh, you can expire out a note and it won't go away, but it'll show that it's expired, it's not active anymore. That works with the alerts um, because you can set up an alert to expire at a certain time so that it doesn't continually pop up. Um, and you can get rid of that because those can be annoying. You get a lot of pop-up alerts and, and then you, it just interferes with your workflow. So only do pop-up alerts if, if you've got something that's really, really important you need to get somebody's attention on. Next we're going to go to the documents. So I know this is a little dry, so everybody stretch, take a drink of water, yawn. I know it's Friday afternoon, but we're going to get through this. Okay, so documents. You've got two tabs under documents, document management and patient documents. So document management is letters. You can think of it as letters or uh, paperwork that the patient needs to complete. Your notes are strictly just comments, but your, your patient documents are actual interaction documents you're going to give the patient. The first thing that you see here, this is kind of confusing. When I first started doing this, I thought, well, this is patient documents, so I'm going to look up a patient and see what documents they have. No, just the opposite. Your first tab is patient specific. The second tab is a print, is a report of sorts or a query of what documents are out there. And then if I wanted to do a return to school on a patient, then you can fill all of this out. And then you can specify which patient here. You can ex do a range of patients, you can exclude a patient, and so forth. But this is more of a bulk, you, it gives you the ability to do bulk documents for multiple patients at one time. Your registrations, if you're going to do a mailer, envelopes, things like that. Let's get back over here to this. Now, as you see, there's nothing in this field. You have the option here, you can click all of these, one of these. And if I had a, if this Kimberly test had a document sitting out here waiting to be printed, or recently had something printed, it would then show up in this area. And then you could highlight it and right click on it and do different things. So if there was a letter for on collections that had went out on the patient, It'll show here. You will then be able to open it and tell the patient, you got a letter about your collections account on this date. So you've been warned three times. Sorry. You've got to pay your bill or you can't come in. Recall documents. This is if you send letters out to the patients regarding their appointment, your reminders. For those patients that booked six months ago, if you want to send them a letter reminding them, that their appointment is coming up. Uh, this was used a lot in getting patients to come back in for physicals or certain types of exams. A lot of that now has gone through the EMR, but it can still be done through the PM if it if you need if you feel like that functionality works better. But for all of the PCMH and your your, you know, your patient-centered medical home, joint commission things, meaningful use, clinical quality measures, I recommend that you do that in the 
EMR so it's trackable for your measures to be counted. And then this is for outgoing referral documents. Uh, so if you start the referrals in your EMR, but you do the certifications and the billing portion and send it to the provider you're sending the patient to, you can create special documents in here and send it out from here. Okay. So next we have service inquiry. I've used this a lot. Um, you've got three tabs here. You've got diagnosis history, procedure history, and HCC diagnosis, which is your Medicare diagnosis checking history. The one that I use the most is procedure history. And I've used it in a sense where patients come back every month or three or four months for specific uh, services or injections and they've forgotten when the last time they came in. You know the J code for the injection they get. You can uh, set up a procedure group for all injections. You can set up a procedure group for specific, you know, services that you do periodically. If you do aesthetic services, Botox and, and certain aesthetics, you can even create a, your special procedures for that and create a group for that, and that way you can even say, you know, Ken has it came back in for her latest uh, microdermabrasion, and she really needs to come in and keep that consistent or it's not going to do her any good. Then you can go back and look and see when the last one was and call and say, hey, you didn't come in for this. We need to get you in here. So that is, that's what the procedure is, and your diagnosis history um, it's mainly just giving you a list of diagnoses for this particular patient. This can link back to some of your reporting tools so that if you need to run on your top 20 diagnoses or you need to run a report on um, a list of patients with a specific diagnosis, and then you can go back and look. Or if you think this patient had a diagnosis of, the, of uh, diabetes and you want to call them, to check on them, then you can go in and look at this and verify that, yes, this patient did have that diagnosis. Automatic registration. So the automatic registration um, mainly is for uh, if you are connected to a hospital system or to another entity and you get registrations from them, so they register over at the hospital and then you want to import those registrations into your system. If you have that interface set up, then you have um, the opportunity to do them in bulk at, at a big group at a time. So it depends that runs by exchange dates or you can actually go through over here and you can see a patient list of all those that are, are sitting out there and ready to, to go. And if you don't want all of them, then you can come over here and you can you can put that information in, put your data in and query. It'll give you the list and you can click on specific patients. When you click on that, then you validate it and you can do the registration, you can update, you can review only changes. So if the patient's already in your system, you want to see if there's any changes, you can highlight that patient and it will let you review those changes. And then once you get that, um, what you want, if you want to just do a bulk, then you can run it here and it will import all those registrations in. So here you can pick and choose, here it will run the whole thing and print you out a list. Okay. So last but not least, I think this is cool because I've worked as a manager, um, I've also worked as an administrator level where I'm monitoring the provider's schedules and if they're staying booked, also from a charge perspective, um, how, our, how our aging is going, how our AR is. This is set up under your system admin. There's a dashboard options, and this gives you that dashboard. It's a great tool to monitor the pulse of your facility. So also it lets, uh, for providers, 
it's really good because you can look back and it depends on how you set this up when the last date it was. You can set it up to run daily, meet weekly, monthly, bi weekly, however you want it. And so it'll tell you from the last date this was updated how they're charging. Are they doing very heavy on the 99215 or are they charging everybody with a 99211? So from an administration perspective, this is really a, a nice little dashboard that you can get at a glance. And I know several managers that come in every day and they look at this so they can kind of instruct their staff. Dr. So-and-so is only booked at 40%, so if you've got a lot of patients that need to be seen today, try to put them on that doctor's schedule. And it, so I really like this and it, it is a great tool. All right, now we're going into scheduling. So the first function group under scheduling is the appointment scheduling. So you have, if you look real quickly, you've got scheduling activities and appointment scheduling. Well, if you're like me, you think scheduling activities means I'm going to do an activity that involves scheduling a patient. So appointment scheduling is kind of redundant. But that's not the case. So let's explain the difference here. So your appointment scheduling is actually where you're going to schedule those appointments. You have three different options, plus you have an activity tab here that we're going to look at. And then your activities, your scheduling activities, is something different. And so first of all, let's look at this. Your patient scheduling. Patient scheduling is you have a particular patient in context and you're going to schedule them an appointment. So I have Kimberly Test in here and I'm going to schedule Kimberly an appointment. I have basic information on Kimberly, so if she has a balance, I can notify her. She needs to pay her balance. She has a copay. I can remind her while I'm scheduling that appointment, she has a copay. Um, I can verify patient information with her, phone number, employer, date of birth, all of that. And if I need to change anything, you've got a button here that's a hyperlink. It'll pull you a separate, that patient summary window with a little bit of financial data, okay? And so if you want to verify more information than what you see in this little snippet, then you can also hyperlink to your registration screen. And it'll actually open what's called a companion window. It does not take you to, a, it doesn't take you out of scheduling, it actually opens a companion window for you to work on the patient's registration without losing your pot, spot in the patient scheduling window. And it lets you have all the same tabs so that you can update that information. Okay, those are called, like I said, a companion window. And as you see in the little tab header up here, it has COM, so companion. All right, the patient is making an appointment and you tell them they have a balance and they want to talk about it right then and there. You can, you can open this window and it will actually give you a little bit of information about how old that balance is. But if they want more information, you actually have a financial inquiry companion window and it'll take you to the window where you can look at the patient's account and it'll do a service listing and the balance on each of those days of service so that you can kind of talk to the patient about it right then. All right, referrals. This is if you need to, uh, let's say you're the specialist office, you need to see if there's a referral on this patient out there before you see them. This referrals will take you to another window that lets you look at the incoming referrals to see if you have the information that you need. If it's not there and you want to continue scheduling the appointment, you have the option of creating that new information and starting this process of a new incoming referral. If you require documentation, you can check the documentation required here. You can attach it to the appointment. 
and it will show in the appointment screen that you need information on this if it's not there. And I'll show you that briefly in just a moment. We're going to cancel this. All right, so then we go down here and we've got recalls. So you're scheduling an appointment for this patient and they need to come back again in a month, two months, three months. You can set a recall date here. So you're scheduling this appointment for three months and the patient says, can you put a note in there to let me know a week in advance so I don't forget? You can put a recall date in here for the week prior and it'll come up on your recall list so that you know that you need to call the patient and remind them of this appointment. This here uh, window right here in the middle, this will uh, have a list of appointments that the patient already has in the system. So if I had um, three appointments for this patient already in the system, before you schedule another one, you can say, this test, did you know you have an appointment next week with this provider? Do you, are, do you need to come in sooner? Do we need to cancel that? It lets you see the future. It's your crystal ball. All right, so coverage types. We're going to skip on down. So this is saying the patient is coming in. Are they going to be seen for their medical, dental, motor vehicle, other? So it depends on what you put in here. If you've got policies linked to different coverage types in your policy tab, it'll pull that along with this appointment. So that's where that comes in handy. Your ailment information, same thing. If you have ailments set up for this patient and the patient says, I'm coming in for my motor vehicle accident, you can pull up that ailment information and make sure it's current and attach it to this appointment. Also, if it's a hospital follow-up, it's good to attach this, especially for Medicare patients, because that helps you with your MSRP. So your scheduling department, your scheduling location and provider is listed here, and this is who is the resource this patient is going to be seeing today. It's not necessarily the primary care, it's whoever you're wanting the patient to see. Now, if you notice, this all defaulted in for me. You might wonder how that happened. Well, a little tip, a little trick. Up here under Tools, under Options. I apologize, the system is so slow. It's Friday and it doesn't want to work. Under Scheduling, you can set defaults for those things. So it saves you some clicks if you set, so if you have a, uh, dedicated scheduler for a certain provider, then you can actually schedule, set the department, the location, and the resource so that your staff saves on clicks and doesn't have to go through and enter all that information. If you have a staff person that schedules for two providers, you can still set the department and location and leave the resource blank, and they will just have to pick the proper resource at that time. Also, if you have special schedulers for your occupational medicine or your, or your um, ophthalmology group or your medical, you can default that in here also. So we are going to schedule this for Dr. Provider Allscripts. And you have your appointment type down here, what type of appointment this is. We're just going to do office visit. And as you see, Depending on what type of appointment type I have here, the duration will default. So your appointment type is set up under file maintenance. You set up your appointment type and you give it a default duration. Now you can override this if you want. So let's say Mary Sue is coming in and your typical appointment for an office visit is 15 minutes, but everybody knows She's going to talk about all her grandkids and where she had lunch yesterday and how good it was and where she's going on her next trip. Um, so, you know, the doctor always says, give me a little extra time when she comes in because it's not going to be a quick visit. You can always override that here. 
And this referring doctor, now remember, under registration, I told you that you have the registration referring doctor. Who referred that patient to establish care at your facility? It might be the actual doctor they're seeing in their office because the insurance referred them. They pulled you off the internet. So this is, did someone refer this patient to you for this visit? So even though this patient might be established, the doctor that referred this patient to you for this particular visit might not be the same person. So you always want to um, update that accordingly. It also will affect your referrals that you have up here. If this referring doctor doesn't match this referral that's coming in, you might have a problem. So you want to make sure to update this referring doctor for your patients. And then your comments here is strictly why the patient's coming in. Sore throat, um, fell down, twisted ankle, that type of thing. So that's what those comments are, and those, this comment will print on your schedule for the reason for visit, basically. Then you have over here days and times. You have on or after, any day, any time, walk-in, recurring. So if the reason this is used is if you have a schedule set up very particular to a provider. You have a provider that only sees new patients on Wednesday afternoon between 2 and 4. Um, they only do physicals in the uh, Thursday mornings at 8 a.m. They only see three acute patients a day and two new patients. And you can get very specific with your provider's schedule. If you utilize that when you're doing your schedule planning, then you can actually do what's called open times. And if you click on open times, it will give you back a list of the next available appointments for that doctor. So that's very helpful if you have a very um, stringent criteria that you work with on a daily basis. Okay? If you're in here and you don't see an opening and you need to force a patient, then you can um, come over here to use the book and it'll take you then to your appointment book so you can force an appointment in. If you see a time and the patient says they want it, you highlight that time and click schedule and it'll actually schedule that appointment right then and there. Okay? This window you will get. Anytime you schedule an appointment, this little window will pop up and it's a summary of what you're doing. So a new appointment is scheduled for this patient for this appointment type, for this duration, with this clinic, with this provider, on this day, at this time. If that's what you want, you click OK. Let's say the appointment is for today, so you need to print an encounter form because you haven't started using your charge and your EHR, so you're still using paper. Shame on you. If you need to print an encounter form, you can click on this, and once you schedule that appointment, it will automatically print an encounter form for you. Okay, if a referral is required for this appointment, then you can also mark it at this point in time that you, a patient must have a referral before they can come in for this appointment. So we're going to cancel that right now. You can link appointments to recalls and referrals. So if you already have something in your scheduling list, you can link appointments. If you're in here and it's a walk-in, you see the walk-in button. If you're scheduling a reoccurring appointment, patient comes in every month, the last Friday of the month, to get their testosterone shot. You can schedule in a recurring appointment for them every time so they don't have to worry about it. And you can go out as far as your schedules will allow. So that's how you schedule a recurring appointment. Okay, now we're going to switch. You can, you can switch over to use the appointment book here by using Use Book, or you can simply switch tabs. My default carried over. Where's my patient? What happened? Well, we have to pull in the schedule first. 
So when you're using the patient scheduling, it's patient specific and you're doing this, the appointment right then. If you are working from the appointment book because you're doing multiple at a time, a lot of people use the appointment book versus the appointment, the patient scheduling. Um, it depends on your facility and, and the workflow that you decide on, which is better. But if you're using the appointment book, you pick all of your default information here, the date that you're wanting to schedule an appointment, and click add a day. What that does then, and it brings today's appointment book in, in view for you, all right? If you need to schedule a new appointment, you can click that, and it'll bring you up a little window here for you to, to search for the patient. However, my patient Kim Test was in, in context over on this other screen, so what happened to him? I wanted Kim Test to come in at 2.30. You can highlight 2.30, do right click, and it'll say view activity restrictions, schedule a new appointment, any patient, gives you that same window. You can force an appointment in, gives you that same window and you can do a walk-in appointment. Now, so this is going to make you have to search for that patient again. However, if I'm doing my appointment management screen, most of your check-in staff will work from this screen, by the way. I've got my default information in here, and I'm going to query what appointments are on the list for today. Well, there's not any. Let's look at Where did my appointments go? There we go. So what that'll do is it'll return a list of appointments that are already there. In your right-click options on here, you have appointment detail, patient information, incoming referrals, scheduling a new appointment this patient. Hey, it remembers the patient. So on the appointment book, it's not going to remember the patient you have in context. If you, if you want it to, you're going to need to schedule from patient scheduling. Or if you work out of your appointment management and you need to add an appointment for this patient that you've got highlighted, then it'll let you do that. Or you can schedule for any, any patient. You can add recalls. You can confirm this appointment. So that's why I say this screen is used mainly for your check-in staff because it's letting you control that, pay, that appointment when the patient gets there. So what I want to look at right now is your options. So you have confirm, acknowledge, wait list, started, checked out, cancel, no show, move, bump, encounter form, medical record request, medical record slip, and appointment reminder. All right, simple appointment detail. You want to see what this patient's coming in for. It gives you a little window. It gives you a summary. It lets you um, hyperlink to referrals. Um, you can also do your confirmed, acknowledged, bumped, canceled, no-show from this screen versus your right-click screen. Referral required can be marked at this point. And coverage, um, is there coverage on this appointment? Is it pending, received, or is there an exception? So when you're calling your patients and confirming or you're working your schedule for tomorrow or the next day, this is a great window to work from. Uh, it gives you some, some tools to work up this patient a little bit before they actually walk in the front door. You've got, again, your encounter form, medical record slip. Now, what is medical record slip? Let me explain that to you just a minute. Your medical record slips, back in the day when we all had paper charts, we had medical record rooms and you had to print the schedule and you had to 
go pull the chart and get it ready for the next day. You could print a medical record slip. You can put it in those little plastic vinyl things and you slide it in where the chart went. That's what those are for. It printed out a little slip for you so you could put it in where the chart's supposed to go so that somebody comes looking for the chart and they know where it's at. Hopefully everybody's on an EMR and they're paperless and you don't have to do that anymore. Your appointment reminders. This is, we'll let you print a reminder for this patient so you can mail it to them if it's, you know, a month from now or two months or three. You're moving this appointment. So the patient calls and says, I've got an appointment today at three o'clock, but I can't make it. Can I come in tomorrow? Well, instead of canceling that appointment and then rescheduling it, you can actually just move that appointment. Now, it will move the encounter with it, but if there's already a voucher started, it will not move that voucher. So if for some reason there's already a voucher started for this appointment, you're going to, you need to cancel it and reschedule it. But if there's nothing tied to it, then um, like a voucher or, or anything like that, you can just move the appointment and it'll move things with it. Bumping is an appointment is the doctor calls in and says, I've got an, a patient at the hospital I need to cancel my afternoon. Um, I need you to move my patients. Then you bump all the patients and it, they go to what's called a bump list. Then you have a list to work from to reschedule those patients. So that is, um, it's, it's a way to manage that urgent need in making a change on the schedule. You can also utilize this for if your physician's book six months out and something comes up, they're going to have to be gone to a CME conference and we need to schedule those patients some other time. You can bump all those patients for that week. The provider's going to be out and you can work off that bump list to reschedule them. So it lets you go ahead and close that schedule so nothing else can be scheduled. But um, it, it does it, it does not lose the patients. So you have a list to work from to reschedule those patients. And then again, the top the items that we talked about earlier. If you have a particular setup that you use all the time here, um, like a bump list. So this is where you can click on your bump list and you can query it and any patients that were bumped will come on this list and a wait list. You have a uh, patient doctor that fills up and then the patient says, can you put me on a wait list if someone cancels Then you can call me. You can actually start a, a wait list for your patients so that if you have a cancellation, you can call. I've seen this used heavily in specialist office when they book so far out, um, the patients get put on a wait list. You can call the patient and get them in. So depending on what you're wanting to do here, um, you can store a job. And by storing a job, um, as you can see here, I have a test view that I did that gives me this patient on this list. Let's say I change this provider and I want to store a same job for this provider. When I click store, it'll ask me to do the name of this job that I want to store. And it asks me the type of job. Is it public or private? So you can store a job in there and anybody can see this stored job. Or you can make it a private and it's only you. It's for your purposes only. And then you click save and it'll save whatever criteria you've put up here. So that kind of helps too if you have staff that um, work multiple providers and it, they don't have to completely re-enter all that. They can just click up here a couple clicks and click query and it'll give them the job, the, the same criteria. Appointment book, let's go back to that real quick. I feel like um, there was something that I missed here that I wanted to talk to you about. So view activity restrictions. 
this is, um, if you set a restriction on this time that only uh, certain things can be scheduled or certain people can use that slot, like your nurse, for instance, for uh, forcing patients in or whatever, you can set some restrictions on that. But uh, for this test environment, we don't have that set up yet. Another thing that I hear a lot of times is people will say, something's wrong with my system. It's not showing all my appointments. I'm only seeing every other one. Something's wrong and they panic. Sometimes what happens is somebody will accidentally change this over here. This is your view in this window. So if you're only seeing every other appointment, check this and make sure it's set to your standard time of 15 minutes or whatever, otherwise it's going to hide patients. So that's the first thing I have them check, is to make sure that they've done it, accidentally clicked on this and hidden some of their screen, their patients. All right, we're running out of time, so I'm going to quickly go through these next three things, because I want to leave some room for some uh, questions at the end. So your scheduling activities, you have your appointment schedule. This is basically a job to run a report, which is, is your appointment schedule. So if you still print your schedules out every day for your staff or your providers, your lab technician, whatever, then you can print um, the schedules here. If it's something you do on a regular basis, you can set the criteria. And here's the little dialog box like we talked about earlier. And here is your level of detail. This tells you the detail that you want on this report. So you set that first, and then you select the resources. In all scripts PM, a resource is not just a provider. A resource can be a procedure room. It can be a service. It can be your nurse's schedules. It can be your radiology schedules. You can be for um, if you're a rheumatology group and you have an infusion therapy suite, it can book your infusion therapy patients. So a resource is not just your provider. So when you're running reports and things, you always want to um, clarify what your resources are. Okay, We're, we also were planning a report um, webcast, and we want to uh, encourage you to do that because we're going to talk about the different types of reports. This is your encounter forms. So if you are still printing your encounter forms, that's what this is for. You can do them by bulk this way. If you need to do them one at a time, you need to do it through your appointment screen. Again, your medical rec records, rec rec slips, recall documents, and scheduling documents. Your scheduling documents can be just that. It can be your registration sheets and different things that you need the, the providers or the patients to fill out, or it can simply just be a schedule. So it depends on what you set your criteria for here. Then you have scheduling reports. This is more analytical. So you have your schedule up here, but then you also have detail reports, Appointment analysis, how many new patients have we seen over the last eight months, encounter tracking and recall. I know I'm running out of time, but I really want to hit encounter tracking. It's very important. I've seen people recruit thousands and thousands of dollars by using this encounter tracking report. It lets you look and see what encounters have been made, what vouchers have been created, and if there's any money tied to that encounter or that voucher. So it lets you track your vouchers and you can track down missing money. So please, play with this report, utilize it. If you don't understand it, let us know. We'll be glad to help you work through it and I can teach you how to use this in your, in your facility. And then again, your recalls, which we've kind of talked about. Your schedule planning. This is opening your schedule. Opening a schedule means blocking a schedule. I know, kind of funny. But when you want to open a schedule here, so for all scripts provider, we're going to see what days this provider has opened. 
let's say this day is already open. It's blocked because it's green. We're going to unblock it. Okay? Then it takes it out. So it means you won't be able to schedule appointments. So you can do your schedule by calendar or by criteria. I really, um, it's kind of your preference. It depends on how detailed your schedules are as to which method works for you. But this is where you actually open and close your schedules for your providers. And this is the referral module where it lets you um, look at your referrals that you've got going out and work them appropriately. Okay, so Carla, I know I'm kind of going over, but do we have any questions that I can answer real quickly? Yeah, we do have a couple. They, they look um, kind of configuration related. So before I even give you these questions, I wanna just mention that at the after the webcast is over, you guys will receive a survey. In that survey, it'll ask you if there are other webcasts you'd like to see. If you're interested in seeing Kim go into configuration in greater detail, I would encourage you to fill that survey out and send it back to us. All right, a couple questions, Kim, on um, registration. Can you set required fields for adding new patients? And then there's a secondary question about um, could required fields be highlighted? Yes, they can, and I do strongly recommend that you set required fields if you haven't. This makes sure that the, that the basic criteria that you need, people won't be able to skip through. And the way you do that is under your um, system administration here, under practice options, You have, um, under registration, you have required fields, okay? When you open that, you'll see a list of all the fields that are available in patient registration. If it's required, you check mark it, okay? If it's not a check mark, it's not gonna be required. This little box here, highlight required fields, this will make the required field turn yellow and we'll take a peek at that. So the required fields will be yellow so that your staff knows that's required and they're gonna to have to know that information before they can move forward. Okay, um, another listener asked if a user could be required to search for a patient using more than one search criteria. Yes, and again, that is under your practice options. And we saw all the criteria that is allowed. Um, but down here under your general tab, under your practice options, down here at the very bottom, it's minimum number of required search by fields. So you can change that to two or three or I think three is the max. So if you change that to two, your exceptions button oh, then is activated and it'll say what fields you are requiring them. Now, notice this here, check the fields for which minimum number of required search does not apply, does not apply. So if you don't want them searching by a certain field as a minimum, then you check marks this to make, check mark this box to make it an exception. Okay, next. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, one last quick one, <laughs> Notice, somebody noticed the triangle icon next to the social security number field and would like to know what that is for. Okay, so let's just pull a patient here. By default, the system automatically truncates the social security number for privacy purposes. But if you ever need to go back into an account and pull the patient's social, you click on this little box and then it'll open a screen and give you access to that social security number. So if the patient you know, says my social security number is wrong, you can look at it that way and uh, 
see it, but by, by default, it's going to truncate that for you. All right. Well, that's all we have time for, Kim. We're out of time. That's it. No more. Again, I want to encourage everybody listening, though, if you have questions um, or you'd like to see Kim do a second webcast on all scripts practice management configuration, definitely respond to your survey. Um, Kim will also post the slide deck that corresponds with this webcast to our wiki. And um, you, you're welcome to reference that at any time. Thank you, everybody, and have a good Friday. Have a great weekend.